Used to be for me, reading was a way of going to battle. You never knew what you were going to come up against, especially with contemporary writers who might have a style you'd never seen before. They might do something weird with sentence fragments or prepositional phrases. And you had to protect yourself from being destroyed, although that was ultimately the goal. Now, I'd just gotten my ass handed to me by Dennis Cooper's Frisk. And like a mewling little bitch, I wanted to scamper back to someone like James who... I instinctually thought could heal me in some way. I really enjoy his later novels in particular. It looks like The Wings of a Dove, uh, The Ambassadors, uh, Portrait of the Lady, which I think is his masterpiece. And The Bostonians is a book I wanted to take a look at. It was, I was looking at the Library of America's edition, which has that really thin onion skin type paper. I don't know, maybe the font was too small. Then I picked up the Everyman's Library Edition, but I uh, found the font too small still. So I picked up the Oxford World's Classic Edition. I'm glad I did because this made me realize that I'd done a massive misreading on this book by looking at the cover of this book here. I'll explain that here in a little second. I found this story to be really interesting because of this character, this young girl named Miss Verena Tarrant, who has this supernatural ability to give really captivating lectures. And her topic of choice is women's rights, suffrage, um, getting women out from under the oppression of of men in the male-dominated society. And she was starting to make a name for herself by giving these speeches at various households. The other character is Miss Olive Chancellor, who's this hardcore proponent of this type of feminism. She's sort of strange and shy, uh, very wealthy, very influential, uh, but kind of like this ramrod man-hater. Through some deal with Verena's parents, uh, she ends up becoming Verena's handler slash manager. But then this third character comes into the picture, and that's Mr. Basil Ransom. Olive's third cousin from Mississippi, and to his bewilderment, he's not really sure why Olive invited him over because there's no chemistry between them. And this was back in a time when I guess it was okay for cousins to hook up with each other. I think James was attracted to his own cousin at some point. Basil Ransom locks into Verena and is fascinated and attracted to her, understandably. And then Olive realizes that it's, it was a mistake to bring him over, and from that point on, very protective of Verena. So when I started reading The Bostonians again, I wasn't exactly on my A-game. I do a lot of my reading in my car, and it's just freaking hot. So I fucked up on this first paragraph here. Basil Ransom comes and visits Olive for the first time, and Olive's sister tells him that Olive will be down to see him. In about 10 minutes, neither 5 nor 15, yet not 10 exactly, neither 9 or 11. And I was thinking for some reason here that she was talking about how old Olive was. Uh, and I read like maybe a third of this book through thinking that Olive was this really wealthy, influential child for some reason. That both of these uh, women were like, like children almost and found it bizarre that what are these two... Uh, kids doing being at the forefront of women's movement in America. A writer like David Shields had mentioned that in his book, Reality Hunger, where, um, you know, if you misread something, sometimes that can be more interesting than what was actually planned out. He describes reading uh, a copy of The New Yorker, thinking that he was reading a short story by Miranda July when really it was a nonfiction article about Bill Clinton. And it turned out that his misreading of that article as a short story was more interesting than the short story itself. On the same lines, Jonathan Lethem had written this article for The Believer where anytime he reads Dickens, he imagines the characters as being like these little animals. Ransom is outspoken and completely diametrically opposed to uh, this whole women's movement. He's extremely chauvinistic. Give yourself to a man. Instead of to a movement of some morbid old maid. But Rena leaves that whole thing unrequited at first uh, because of her loyalty to Olive. And it becomes clear to Olive that Ransom is just the nuisance. He's like, he's like this sand in their oyster, but instead of a pearl, he turns out to be a turd. Her whole thing is to protect Verena from this threat of all these men like sharks clamoring around this piece of soft white bread but the thing is this this piece of bread doesn't seem to mind being nibbled upon dating seemed to occur at an accelerated pace back then just 
two characters spending time alone with each other could be extremely dangerous. Olive would ask her point blank, did he make love to you just for being gone for an hour? I don't think she actually means, did he fuck you in the park? Basil Ransom as an antagonist, he doesn't really come off as all that sinister when compared to other antagonists in James novels like Gilbert Osmond in Portrait of the Lady. And I think a lot of this book hinges upon whether you would believe that someone like Verena Tarrant would actually fall for someone like Basil Ransom. The idea that she becomes disenchanted with her quest and her gift is kind of an interesting one. James seems to paint his characters with these large brush strokes, and there seems to be missing that that subtle shading, that chiaroscuro that he does so well. Now, without giving away the ending here, what's really remarkable about James is the fact that his books can be spoiled if you talk about them. The plot usually just continues all the way to the final scene, and that can end in a very climactic moment of decision for a character. Put this book in the context of James's life. You know, this book was written after A Portrait of a Lady, but before what I consider the major events of his life, such as the failure of his only play, Guy Donville, being the object of unrequited love from his friend Constance Fenimore Wilson, his own unrequited love towards uh, well, I guess it's unrequited. Um, a much younger sculptor named Hendrik Anderson. Earlier I had read his biography and it was so massive that I had to chop it up into three separate volumes. And this is the abridged version, actually. The the complete version is much longer. But honestly, to me, this book stands in the shadow of like some of his other major novels. But still, there's always something to enjoy about James. I really like how he does his dialogue. For me, it's it's really unique. He has these characters kind of repeating each other, tossing certain words and phrases back and forth at each other. It's almost kind of flirtatio flirtatious and there's this unlocking of energy and kind of get this sense that he has this love of symmetry, almost artificial in a way, and you know, he kind of ties a nice bow at the end of every exchange. Also how deep he goes into the minds of these characters, like this worm that just burrows and doesn't know when to stop as far as how deep he goes, and he just kind of pulls you along in, through these tunnels that he creates. Huge walls of dense prose is like ecstasy. It gives you that illusion as well that he's improvising as he's going along, especially in those dialogue sections, but as we know with James, he really platted things out. Like he would completely know the entire outline of the story maybe a year or two before he would sit down and write it. And it didn't seem like he did a whole lot of rewriting. I don't think a lot of writers during this time period uh, allowed themselves that luxury or they looked down upon the act of rewriting. Cranking it back this far though, you kind of have to get in a different mode because culture was just so different back then. There seemed to be this level of formality and decorum with these characters that just don't seem to exist today. But uh, as far as other writers that I really enjoy during this time period, uh, aside from the Russians, would be Stendhal and Joseph Conrad. And I think what makes those writers so enduring is not, not only the strength of their stories, but the style at which they tell them. And for me, James is like picking up a pair of antique glasses that seem really fragile and dusty, but when you put them on, you're rewarded with the most clearest vision. And not only that, when you take them off and you look up at the world, everything is just in focus. And there's this clarity, almost like this mathematical clarity as a result, especially after reading some of his later work that I really appreciate about James.